Hi, everyone. Welcome to the NASIA webinar on incorporating equity concerns into resilience planning. My name is Kirsten Burkhoff. I am the Managing Director for Electricity and Energy Security at NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Officials. We're really excited to have a great group of speakers today talking about equity concerns and resilience, and we're excited to have you all here uh, joining us for the webinar. Before we get started, I'll go over a few housekeeping items. Um, this is a virtual meeting. Of course, we're all now very familiar with those, but just as a reminder, um, it's a Zoom webinar format, so you'll see the presenters, um, but you all are muted. If you have any tech issues, please send a chat to my colleague Kelsey Jones in the chat box or email her at kjones at nasio.org. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end after the speakers have presented. Um, so if you have any questions, please enter them through the Q&A feature or in the chat box and we'll get to them um, as many as possible at the end. Next slide, please. So this is our agenda for today. Um, we will be having opening comments, introductions by Carrie Hearn, and I will turn it over to her in just a moment. And then we hear um, from uh, our speakers, Dr. Duanwei Wang, Seth Mullendore, and Jeremy Twitchell. And then we'll have a time for a Q&A and open discussions until um, 3 p.m. when we close the webinar. Next slide, please. Again, as I mentioned, we will have this moderated by Carrie Hearn. She's the Associate Director of the Energy Equity Programs at the Virginia Department of Energy. And I'm very excited to turn it over to her. But before I do, I would be uh, remiss to not send out a thank you to the US Department of Energy Office of Electricity, who supports our work, and also my colleague, Kelsey Jones, who's been really the brains of bronze behind this webinar. Um, so thank you for um, all you did on this, Kelsey. So with that, um, I'm turning it over to Carrie. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Kirsten, for inviting me to moderate. Again, my name is Carrie Hearn, uh, Associate Director of Energy Equity Programs at the Virginia Department of Energy. And you may have known us before as the Department of Mines, Minerals and Energy. We just went through a rebrand. And so you can drop the DMME and replace it with Virginia Energy in your lingo. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, be the first Energy Equity Programs Associate Director at the agency. And so as such, we are beginning to develop our practices and programs around how we approach energy equity and ensure that all Virginians can access the benefits of the clean economy transition and ensure that energy burdens can be reduced and that we create a more resilient uh, energy system in the process. And so with that, there are just a few program areas that I'd like to highlight within Virginia, and then I'll um, introduce our esteemed speakers. Just a couple of things that have been happening in recent years in Virginia, we have entered into the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, REGI, and so part of those funds are going to funding low income energy efficiency measures, and then another significant part of those funds are looking at uh, flood prone areas across the Commonwealth and addressing issues relating to resilience and, and climate change impacts around uh, sea level rise, as well as other flood prone areas and having a particular environmental justice and equity focus within those programs. In addition, we'll be tracking historically economically disadvantaged communities, as well as environmental justice across the Commonwealth and understanding how our clean economy transition is going to be either placing disproportionate burdens or bringing new opportunities into these communities um, as we transition to clean energy. Um, in a recent NASIO webinar, we also presented on a project that we're working on uh, to analyze opportunities around microgrids on Tangier Island. So take a look at that past webinar if you haven't attended that already. So without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce our set of esteemed speakers. First up, we have Dr. Zhang Hui Wang, with, um, the, who's a professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering with Southern Methodist University. And following Dr. Wang, we have Seth Mullendore, Vice President and Project Director with the Clean Energy Group. And then finally, we have Jeremy Twitchell, who's a Senior Energy Analyst with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And so with that, we will turn it over to Dr. Wang to begin, and we'll have audience question and answer at the end. Please do submit your questions in the chat. 
uh, I'm sorry, in the Q&A box, and we'll address those at the end. Over to you, Dr. Wang. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to present some of the work that we do uh, in this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, thank you for the invitation. So the title of my uh, uh, presentation is to incorporating equity in power system resilience um, planning and op operation. Next slide, please. Um, yes, so, and then this slide shows you that uh, the overview of power grid resilience in this space. And you can see that uh, power grid resilience can be divided into several, uh, several stages. Uh, prepare, mitigate, respond, and recover. If you look at the figure on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, we can take measures from the technical point of view before the events, during the events, and after the events. So if you look at the boxes at the bottom there, you can see that the before events, you can do your uh, uh, components hardening, right? So you can build more transmission line. You can even convert your overhead transmission line to underground cable. Uh, so that will make the system more uh, reliable. Uh, of course, that comes with a cost. So you need to consider that. And also we can uh, do your vegetation uh, management and also we can, um, uh, and we can elevate the, some of the, the ground so that we can uh, make sure that uh, those uh, some devices may not be flooded during those uh, extreme events. And also during the events, there are multiple measures that you can take um, from the technical point of view. You can do your load shining, meaning that uh, if there are some non-critical load that you can shed, then you can reduce the overall burden on the power system. And also, if you have some um, demand response um, uh, program in place, then you can call those demand responsive demands so that they can reduce the demand based on the signal that you send to them. And also, uh, you can have microgrids. So you can do your microgrid islanding operation meaning that uh, you can isolate the microgrid from the overall system. So the community, the consumers within that microgrid will make sure that they still have the reliable electricity supply from the local generation. And also you can change the topology of the system by reconfiguring the different parts of the system. And, uh, so, and also you can uh, schedule the different repair crews because the problem that we are facing here is not just the power system problem alone. So, it involves some other fields, some other logistic issues as well. So repair crew dispatch is also uh, is one of them. And also there are uh, mobile generators that are being deployed in the system. So you can route those mobile generators to the places where you need them the most. And then of course you have those black star and resolution measures that you can take. And in between them, you can see that data fusion modules here. So data plays a very important role in the overall picture here. So those are the current um, uh, advances that we have had re related to power system uh, resilience. So mostly, as you can see, they are based on certain kind of optimization problem formulation. And also you can execute some controls, include uh, microgrid islanding, and uh, you can implement some advanced management system to collect the data. But uh, still, we have a lot of issues that have not been addressed yet. So one of the issues that we are missing here is that the lack of equity consideration in our current system planning and operation. So when we do our current system planning and operation, we have not, I mean, uh, emphasis on the equity issue that much in the past. So that has resulted in some places, some events, such as the Texas event in the past winter, where the low-income communities suffer more than the average communities. So that issue needs to be uh, taken care of. That's our topic here today. And now associated with that issue is that how you can have a good resilience metric to measure the uh, to measure uh, resilience. Re resilience is different from reliability, right? Reliability is the events that uh, you see every day. So you may have a transformer a trip, and you may have a power plant uh, power uh, uh, transmission line down. So that's the events that you may see every day. But the resilience is a, a high uh, impact, low probability events. So how you can measure those uh, resilience issue. So that's a, a key point here. And also how you can take into equity consideration in resilience metrics, because you need to describe how those um, uh, low income equity, uh, low income communities suffer from that a certain resilience event. So extreme event modeling is very important and also 
that we do not have in, uh, sufficient stakeholder engagement uh, as far as I, I see, uh, because in the current planning process, we do not engage those low income uh, communities. Uh, the uh, low income communities are the ones that need that kind of a reliable transmission uh, power supply in those events. And also, we are missing some of the interstate, interregional coordination because the extreme weather events, they are large scale. They, they come across multiple um, uh, regions. So those are interstate, interregional coordination is also very important here. Again, the last point here is that the problem is not um, the power system problem anymore. You cannot really analyze the problem in silos. And what we are facing here, what we are facing here is the interdependent problem. Uh, for example, again, the Texas event is not just the power grid issue, it's also the gas supply. If you don't have fuel, you cannot um, power up those power plants. So those are uh, infrastructures they are coupling with each other so that we need to take a look at the problem from this uh, com comprehensive and overall point of view. Next slide, please. And we have done some work uh, in this space and this uh, work is um, the paper that we pub published back in 2016. So in this paper, we analyze distribution system planning against the natural disasters. So here, we are basically uh, consider those uh, extreme events, how you can model those. Basically, if you, if you see that uh, you can forecast, uh, if you assume that uh, the extreme events is gonna, un uh, is gonna unfold uh, during a time uh, horizon in the future, and you can see that uh, that events, that a hurricane may follow a certain path. If you look at this uh, upper uh, right uh, figure here. So if you know that, um, that the events has a possibility of following that path, and you can define this uh, worst case scenario by using this multi-stage, multi-zone uncertainty set. So which here, which meaning, means here that we model that path of that, uh, uh, of that uh, unfolding extreme events, that hurricane, sweeping through the region, we can model that. So by using this kind of a scenario analysis, we can model, we can capture that, uh, that the probabilities and uncertainties associated with that uh, extreme events. Our results uh, can show you that with this kind of measures, we can greatly enhance the power grid uh, resilience. Uh, next slide, please. On the higher uh, voltage level, on the transmission level, we can also do transmission hardening planning. This is another piece of work that we did back in 2018. So here we are assuming that you may not have perfect information about the future renewable generation because that's hard to forecast. Also, extreme event forecasting is not that easy also. So then in this case, we can use advanced optimization technique. Uh, this is the, the technique that we are using here, the decisionally robust optimization. So we use that. The technique. So we do not have uh, to know the perfect information about that renewable or extreme events. Basically, you have this family of um, probabilistic dis distributions. Then you can define this um, uh, lower bound so that you can make sure that your method will capture uh, mo most of that. So by using that kind of a measure, you reduce the overall conservativeness of this uh, framework. So you can better the capture the, uh, uh, the uncertainty event. Next slide, please. And this slide shows you one of the real uh, projects that, that we are working on um, in addition to the papers that we have uh, published. So this is um, the project we got funded by DOE Solar Office this year. This project is about the resilience community microgrids with a dynamic reconfiguration to serve critical loads uh, in those uh, extreme events uh, uh, scenarios. So here, basically, we are trying to develop advanced the network microgrids. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned microgrids in your opening remarks. So microgrids is a, a key component in your overall uh, power grid resilience uh, improvement measures. So here we are not just looking at one, at one microgrid. We are looking at a cluster of microgrids because I think that's gonna be one of the future uh, technologies that can address this resilience issue dramatically. So when you have um, a lot of DERs, so those DERs can form a microgrid surrounding uh, those DERs. So then those microgrids can supply their local demand. They are also capable of talking to each other. You have surrounding microgrids, you can connect them, you can make sure that they can talk to each other, you can, they can provide mutual support within them. So by doing this, by interconnecting 
those are microgrids, you build a system, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in a more reliable way. So in that case, and that's our uh, vision here. So we are going to build that kind of a technology, that's kind of scenario. Now in the end, we're gonna uh, uh, implement that in the field on, uh, on the Duke uh, system there. As you can see from the task one and task two, we put this uh, community uh, stakeholder engagement and outreach uh, front and center here, because we realize that without uh, sufficient community uh, engagement, um, and the rest uh, is, is meaningless. So we want to make sure that we have enough, uh, we reach out to the different stakeholders and the communities so that we take the, their input uh, as we go along with this uh, project here. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, here that uh, equity should be really realized at a different levels here. This figure shows you the different uh, uh, information sources that have talked about the different um, uh, equity issues at the different levels. So at the community and the regional level, we should really focus on these low income communities because uh, studies have shown that the low income communities that the equity issue uh, where the equity issue is are the ones that are most hard hit. And I'm gonna talk about it in more detail in the later slides. And on the, re on the national level, as you can see, uh, this is an article from Fox. As you can see, there are different, uh, different uh, uh, regions in the US, they have different uh, extreme weather events, stress, right? So at the Texas, we have this uh, very harsh winter going on. In the Northeast region, we have snowstorm. And on the West Coast, we have those um, uh, wild fires. So we have different issues here. We have different issues that will force you to take a different uh, measures against those, the different scenarios. On the, on the international level, the equity issue is still uh, a big issue here. Uh, it's uh, up to this point of, of, the, uh, of the history, we still have about 16% of the world population without access to uh, electricity. As we all know that electricity is an underlying driver for economic development. So how you can, how we can, I mean, in, uh, how we can uh, uh, take, uh, take care of that equity issue on the international platform. We can give increase the access to those uh, rural and uh, pro communities is a, is a huge task, is a huge mission for us. Uh, next slide, please. And focusing on Texas here. Uh, so here, this map shows you the study that done, that uh, sponsored by this Rockefeller Foundation. This is a map of Houston. So, and then uh, this is a, 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 a satellite image, a, a imagery from the Texas winter storm this past winter. As you can see, those pink and, and the red colors, those are the low income communities. As you can see that you can see a lot of pink, a lot of red here. Those are the places that are hit the most during that winter, uh, that, that uh, winter storm. If you click your mouse, and you can see the lesson that we got from that study is that those uh, low-income communities they suffer four times more than the average communities in uh, Houston. So that tells you the se the severity that the low-income uh, low-income uh, communities have have suffered from those um, un, uh, insufficient uh, transmission uh, and the distribution planning without consideration of equity issue here. Next slide, please. And uh, so we need to take uh, uh, actions. So first action that we need to take is that we need to have good data. The image, the imagery analysis that I just showed shows you how powerful those imagery analysis is. And also there are other sources of data that we can use when we do our transmission and distribution planning. There's census data that we can use. There's a historical ultimate data we can use from this um, website, from NERC and the other uh, sources. And then there's a uh, certain data as I mentioned, and also the type of the data, like asset, asset age, material circuit, and the length is also important based on the study uh, done by SMU. And also there's tool by DOE uh, LEAD, low income energy affordability data tool. That can, be, uh, that can be also useful. So there are multiple sources of data that we can use. It's just that uh, we need to take action to use that. Next uh, slide, please. And the lesson two that we got from this uh, past event in Texas is that uh, so the government of all levels should prepare more systematically for upcoming disastrous events. So it's not just an on-course problem. 
it's everybody's uh, issue here because we all suffer. As a resident of, uh, of Dallas, we have many neighbors, we have many friends. Uh, we have never, uh, we have many friends uh, that have uh, sustained um, a long period of a power outage in the past winter. And, and as a matter of fact, one of my colleagues at, at uh, SMU, they, he still hasn't have his home fixed yet. I mean, uh, like uh, 10 months after the uh, natural disaster. So this is a really serious issue. So we need to take a, a proactive strategic planning actions with equity in mind. Uh, engage, engage, and engage. So when we do the planning, we should really, really engage those um, needed uh, communities. We need to know what they want and how we can take their needs into our consideration when we do our planning. We need to develop uh, more uh, sound emergency plans. And also you can uh, do more technical measures like a pre-position uh, crews and then those mobile drivers and buy more DERs, build more microgrids, and if it's ensure the reliable electricity supply to those warming centers. So those are all the measures that, that you can take. Uh, next slide, please. And the lesson three that we got is that, so the disadvantaged uh, community should be given higher priority. Uh, again, this study that um, from the past winter, we really learned that um, those communities, they are most hard hit. So uh, some priority should be given to them when we do our transmission uh, uh, planning and, uh, uh, and uh, operation. So we should know that um, they are uh, the ones that uh, should come into the picture when we, when we do our planning, how we can consider their needs. That's a really important point that we need to uh, take care of going forward. Next slide, please. So uh, I know my time is up. So uh, in conclusion, as you can see, a lot of work has been done uh, from, from pre-disaster planning to post-disaster uh, repair. So a lot of work has been done, but it's not enough. Uh, uh, in particular, the equity issues are not fully addressed in most existing works. So there's a lot more uh, to be done. And that lesson from text wind storm show you that uh, the disadvantaged communities are hit more than average uh, communities. So this equity, should it be in, in everyone's mind when we do um, our planning for the future natural, uh, be, uh, for, the, for the future events. Because you can, you can do whatever you want to do, but you cannot avoid those events from happening again. What you can do is just to uh, prepare and plan better for the future events. The red figure shows you the special issue of proceedings of, of HB that I edited a few years back. So I invited um, all the world uh, renowned experts in resilience to contribute to this special issue. And, and if you are interested, and I, I would suggest you take a look. And uh, this is my last slide. And uh, I will, would uh, welcome any question that you may have. Great, so uh, th th thanks Dr. Wong. That was a good setup for what I'm gonna talk about. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Seth Molendor, I'm Vice President for Clean Energy Group. Clean Energy Group is a, a national nonprofit advocacy organization working on uh, helping to ensure a more just and equitable transition to a clean energy future. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our sister organization, Clean Energy States Alliance. So I'm gonna talk about solar and storage for energy resilience, specifically local community resilience. Yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, one of our big areas of work is what we call our resilient power project. This project was launched uh, about eight years ago in the wake of Superstorm Sandy in the Northeast. As uh, Dr. Wong was talking about in Texas, that was another case where we saw that, that low-income communities and communities of color were hit worst when disaster struck and there were widespread outages across the region. The, the goal of the Resilient Power Project is to enable more equitable access to clean, resilient power technologies. For us, that primarily means solar PV paired with battery storage. Um, and we tend to work on projects that are, are microgrids at the individual specific building level. Um, so we facilitate the exploration and development of solar and storage serving low-income communities and communities of color. And we also assist community-based organizations with knowledge building around solar and storage technologies. And to make all of this work, we also work to engage um, municipal, state, and federal policymakers to try to help uh, develop and implement enabling policies and programs that can make the, the economics of these systems work. Um, and cover the, some of the, uh, the gaps that are existing right now. So next slide. Uh, a big component of that work is through the, the grant support that we have from, from foundations, number of foundations, 
uh, we have established a technical assistance fund. So Clean Energy Group, we provide uh, in-house, we provide technical assistance and support to help groups across the country, uh, help them understand what solar storage is, what it can and can't do uh, for energy resilience and, and economics. And then we have this technical assistance support um, grant program, technical assistance fund that provides pre-development grants to nonprofits serving low-income communities and communities of color to engage third-party engineering expertise. So to go out and get a techno-economic feasibility assessment for a specific site. Uh, we've worked with over 300 different facilities across the U.S., over 100 different uh, partners. I think we've worked in 23 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico at this point. And um, we've had a good chunk of those projects actually reach the, uh, the, the completion phase. A few of those are, are highlighted here. Uh, in the next few slides, you can go to the next one. I'm going to just walk through what a few of those projects look like so that you have an idea what I'm talking about. So we're going to kind of go from smaller to larger, although I'm not going to get into some of the very big ones. We tend to work with mid-sized projects. Um, we don't do a lot on single family uh, residential, but this is one exception. It's called McKnight Lane, and this is a redevelopment of a defunct mobile home park in uh, Waltham, Vermont. So it was redeveloped as 14 modular net zero homes. Um, and the planning design included solar, but did not include energy storage. So we worked to make sure that these uh, affordable rental homes also included energy storage, which basically back up all the essential services in, in, the, in the building. Uh, solar is six kilowatts, storage is six kilowatt hours. We also worked with the local utility, Green Mountain Power, to um, help pay for part of the cost of these batteries. So Green Mountain Power will tap into these batteries along with the batteries they have uh, across the state, both small and large, to be able to provide grid services, so demand response services or balancing services to lower the cost for Green Mountain Power and for all the customers that they serve. And those services, that value helped offset a good chunk of the cost of these battery systems. Foundation support came in to, to help with the rest. On the next slide is a bit bigger project. Uh, this is in Puerto Rico, in, in San Juan after Hurricane Maria devastated the island. Uh, we were we linked up with a, a group called uh, Disaster Relief. They're an international uh, disaster aid organization. Um, they worked with most of the community health clinics in Puerto Rico, uh, supplying them with uh, medical supplies post Maria and, and throughout the year prior to that. What they found was that they were spending a lot of money on gas for diesel generators for these after Maria. As many of you know, the full power wasn't actually restored to everywhere in Puerto Rico for a year after Maria. And still to this day, power is, is an issue across Puerto Rico. So instead of continuing to, to pay for generators, diesel generators, which often failed during the extent outage as well, uh, they decided to pursue solar and storage. So we helped work with them on a number of clinics. This one, Clinica Aea. Um, a pretty small system. It's mainly meant to provide power to refrigeration so that uh, medical supplies that need to be refrigerated um, can, can remain powered and they don't end up losing a lot of supplies, which has happened again and again. You hear that in every disaster. Uh, so moving up from there, a bit larger profit property. This is in Washington, D.C. It's called the Maycroft Apartments. This is a, a I believe about 60 unit affordable housing development in a, a low income neighborhood of DC. This is a pretty uh, good size solar system for distributed solar, about 64 kilowatts, and energy storage, about 65, or uh, sorry, 56 kilowatt hours. Uh, they converted a community space in the bottom of the development to be able to act as a resilience center so that their residents will have access to refrigeration. Uh, fans for cooling, microwaves for, for food preparation, uh, of course, lighting, uh, TV, and, and outlets to be able to charge not just phones, but also medical devices. A number of residents uh, depend on electricity for their medical needs and, and find it difficult to relocate in, in a disaster. Uh, the wonderful thing about Maycroft is that the solar system is also set up as a community solar array. So that that system and actually a few other systems across DC uh, the, the power from that is directly linked to the residents' utility bills, and they each save about $40 to $50 a month off of their utility costs, um, reduced by that, that community solar benefit. So this is an example of, of some of the projects that we work with. Um, 
why we do this, we go to the next slide. Uh, you know, we're trying to really address the, the main barriers to solar and storage adoption, particularly for uh, equity purposes. So, so community-based organizations are ones we work with a lot or affordable housing developers. We did this survey in, in the past year, uh, it's called Overcoming Barriers to Solar and Storage in, in Critical Facilities Serving Low-Income Communities. This is a survey of about 60 uh, providers, whether it's affordable housing providers or, or community-based organizations, also some developers as well that are working in the low income space, um, the, the equitable distribution of, of solar and storage. The biggest barrier was lack of information about battery storage that the, these projects encountered. About 65% of respondents followed by technical issues and then permitting and interconnections. So our technical assistance program and the technical assistance we provide are meant to address those top three. Uh, the next two are financing and economic feasibility of projects, uh, which we'll, if we go to the next slide, that's the, the other aspect of the work that, that we do. Um, we've helped develop some financing programs for low-income solar and storage, um, but a lot of our, our big work is around policy and program development. We've uh, been particularly active in the Northeast, in, in the New England area, uh, particularly in Massachusetts, this uh, the image on the left is a report we recently put out on a program called Connected Solutions. What this basically does is set up a revenue opportunity for energy storage to provide uh, demand response. Um, we made the case that energy storage should be considered an efficiency measure by reducing kilowatts, so consumer demand instead of kilowatt hours, um, as, as uh, efficiency is traditionally thought of. So these batteries act as a system-wide, um, basically peak power plant. They can be aggregated together and provide uh, demand when, when there, there are high uh, needs for energy on the system. So it leverages existing energy efficiency funds, uh, which means that they didn't have to find a new pool of money to support these programs. Um, it benefits the entire utility grid instead of just individual customers that might have say a high utility demand charge. Uh, which is traditionally how batteries have been paid for. All, all ratepayers benefit from this because it lowers system costs. And it provides a direct revenue opportunity for these battery system owners, um, which is available to all customers, regardless of their utility provider in, in Massachusetts and other states that have this, and their rate structure. So traditionally, batteries, uh, there wasn't very much economic uh, case for batteries at the residential level, but there are not demand charges, um, kilowatt related charges for those bills. This erases that need and all uh, customers that have batteries are able to tap into this program, which provides quite a big benefit over the year to participate in it. It also allows for larger system designs, not listed, uh, it's not limited by on-site demand. Uh, so the, the types of battery systems that you would need for a significant level of resilience to be able to provide backup power, tend to be bigger than those that are sized for economics of say, lowering on-site demand. Because this program is looking at regional demand, you have much larger batteries. It also offers the opportunity to incorporate uh, equity factors and equity considerations and resilience. So Connecticut is just about to roll out this program in the new year. They are including uh, a number of equity provisions uh, such as uh, higher incentives, higher adders for low-income communities and disadvantaged communities, uh, on-bill financing and upfront rebates for low-income customers and, and those located in disadvantaged communities. And they're also providing um, backup or providing additional adders for uh, those that provide energy resilience. And again, the important thing with these programs is that it aggregates a lot of batteries together, to basically work as a virtual power plant. You've heard of that term before. On the next slide, I'm just gonna talk uh, in closing about one other project that we have called the Phase Out Peakers Project. Uh, this is a collaborative effort to work with local environmental justice and, and community groups to phase out traditional fossil fuel peaker plants, which tend to be located closer to urban populations. And um, while they're not the biggest source of say, greenhouse gas emissions, because they don't operate as often, they just operate at times when the grid is stressed, they are big sources of local air pollutants, particularly NOx, um, which has severe impacts on uh, respiratory systems uh, of local communities, as well as a number of other contributing factors we found with, with COVID. It was a big contributing factor to, to higher infection rates and mortality rates. 
with a group in, in New York City, uh, includes the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, New York Lawyers for Public Interest, and two community groups, uh, Uprose and DePoint. We put out a couple of reports. Those are on the, on the right side. Uh, Dirty Energy, Big Money looked at uh, several billion dollars uh, that went to, to operate the peakers in New York City over a year period of 10 years and the significant uh, emissions impact on, on local communities. The second, the fossil fuel endgame, these are both available on our website if you want to look at them uh, at cleanegroup.org. Uh, the fossil fuel endgame lays out a plan to, to implement solar, wind, primarily offshore wind in New York City, uh, battery storage and efficiency and demand measures as an alternative to peaker plants and found that you could reliably and cost-effectively cost phase out New York City's peaker plants over the next 10 years. Um, so an important environmental justice consideration as it's usually the lower income and, and minority communities that are impacted by these urban uh, peaker power plants. And so with that, I'm gonna close out my portion of the uh, presentation, but please do feel free to, to reach out to me at, at seth.cleaningroup.org and love to answer your questions uh, at the close of the presentation today. All right. Uh, I want to thank my, my co-presenters for uh, the work they've done and what they've shared with us today. It really makes my job easier to back clean up here. Um, so my name is Jeremy Twitchell. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'll be speaking today about how we can um, adjust our planning processes to incorporate new objectives like resilience, like equity. Uh, I want to acknowledge the, the work of my co-author here, Bethel Terry Kane. She's really our leader for a lot of this equity work that I'll be presenting today. Unfortunately for you, she was busy, so you're, you're stuck with the resilience guy, um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Next slide, please. So, you know, traditionally our, our grid planning processes, they, they tell us two things. Do we have a reliable grid? Do we have a cost-effective grid? And that's, we can do that because we have a ton of standards and metrics that say, this is what reliability is. This is how you plan a grid to be reliable. This is what these resources have to do. This is how we measure it. This is how we report it. So while that works well for the current planning paradigm, it does create some pretty significant obstacles for, for new objectives, things like resilience, like equity. Um, you know, because when we talk about resilience, we don't have those same kind of standards. We don't have NERC standards. We don't have IEEE metrics. So when we say we want a more resilient system, that kind of doesn't really mean anything. We can't put that into a planning model and say, here's what the resilient system will look like. We don't even really have a, an agreed upon definition, let alone metrics. Um, similarly for equity, um, you know, we, the, the way we measure the performance of the grid right now, it's all based on system averages. So we don't really see how um, different customers are having different experiences with the grid. Customers that face increased burdens from uh, fossil fuel emissions, customers that face increased burdens from rate structures. You know, we, we don't see how and where these customers exist, how they interact with the grid. Um, you know, so really the, the key takeaway from this, this slide here is that Standards and metrics form the why of grid planning. Everything we do in planning is basically a benefit cost analysis. How much does this resource cost? What benefits will it provide to the grid? And where we have, excuse me, reliability metrics that tell us what those benefits are, that's a pretty simple process. But where we don't have metrics that tell us what resilience is, that tell us what equity is, that gets much more complicated. Next slide, please. So one of the, and you can just click through these, uh, one more, thanks. So, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing in this space, and I will just say that there is a ton of work happening at the national labs um, through the Department of Energy and the, the equity and resilience phase space right now. Um, a lot of that work is kind of centered around energy storage because it really is a game changer, for, both for resilience applications and equity applications. On the resilience side, you know, historically, if we wanted to have resilience, you know, you, you bought a backup generator, you put the generator on site, if the grid goes down, you turn on the generator. That's expensive. You have to buy the generator, you have to buy the fuel, you have to do the, the upkeep on it, the maintenance. And so we, we've been in this paradigm that I, I call mission critical resilience because it's as expensive. And I saw a question that's in fact, resilience is expensive right now. Um, you only see it at mission critical facilities, hospitals, military facilities, places like that. But now with energy storage, now we have kind of an economic paradigm for resilience. We can take energy storage, we can pair it with that generator, we can pair it with solar, wind, whatever just other distributor resources we have there. And we can shape the output of those resources in a way that now we can provide valuable services to the grid. Now we can sell services. Now we can provide other benefits to the grid. 
And so what that does is for that 99.9% .9 of the time that the grid is up and we don't need the resilience, we're generating offsetting revenue because of those reliability metrics that allow us to, to, to gain value from the resource and sell services to the grid. Next slide, please. Um, from an equity standpoint, um, energy storage, you know, because it's scalable, it can be cited closer to customers so that the benefits of the resource can be targeted much more granularly than other types of resources that are out there. Um, this is some of the work that, that Bethel has done. Uh, there's some links to reports on the bottom there, just looking at some of these different benefits, you know, think, looking at how storage can be used to, uh, to reduce the impacts of fossil fuel uh, emissions like we just heard from Seth. Um, we, how storage can be used to help customers manage their, their energy, ma manage their energy costs, build local community wealth, um, increase property values, create jobs, uh, reduce the footprint of traditional energy infrastructure. And of course, the, the resilience as well, um, making communities more resilient against, against storms and other interruptions that may come. Next slide, please. So in order to unlock these benefits, we, we really need to rethink the way we do planning. So traditional grid planning processes, they're very top down. You know, we look at the, the entire grid at once. We look at the large generators, we look at the transmission system, and we study how, how we get energy from, from these large central generators to, to the customers. Um, to think about how we really start to weave resilience and equity into those planning processes though, uh, one of the things that, that I would personally argue that there's, there's some out there who would argue is that we need to think about this from a bottom up standpoint, you know, start down closer to those customers and how do we identify how we invest in the local grid to create the resilience and equity benefits that we need. Um, so what you'll see here is uh, kind of this localized planning framework that we came up with, uh, where we argue that we should treat resilience and equity as local values. Don't think of them as system values, think of them as local values. So the first step here is to identify critical loads. And it's just kind of a thought exercise. If the grid goes down, what resources, what loads need to be kept back up? You know, and there's obvious answers to this, hospitals, emergency centers, there's less obvious answers as well. Um, pumping stations, uh, potentially, you know, hotels, ports, airports, you know, just depending on where you are and, and what the local needs are. And this is also a point where you can really think about weaving in equity considerations as well. You know, are there customers who, are, who face greater impact in the event of an outage? Are there customers who, um, you know, are, are we identifying the critical loads in all areas of the system? Are we making sure that, that all customers have access to those, those critical services in the event of an outage? Um, and then, so then we identify risks. Once we've identified these sites, what are we worried about? You know, what is that, what are we trying to guard against? Are there regular kind of routine reliability issues that we have to guard against? Are we worried about like a, a winter cyclone, a flood, a, a public safety power shutoff? You know, we have to really get granular about what we're worried about. And then in step three, we have to think about, okay, if this event happens, what are the impacts to this load that we've identified? How much load will we need to maintain and for how long? Because again, we don't have resilience metrics that we can put into a model and say, give me a resilient system. So we have to tell the model, I need this much load for this long. And now that's something the model can work with. Now it can identify the investments necessary to do that. And so finally, in the planning phase, we, we talk about kind of this iterative planning process, looking at the site needs, but then also looking at the local grid needs. Because again, if we want this to be economic, we have to figure out how we can benefit the local grid and what services we can sell to the grid. You know, these may be ancillary services. Can we do um, some kind of transmission or distribution deferral? Can we help with congestion management? But kind of an iterative process here so that we design a project that meets all the local site needs we've identified, but can also provide value to the grid and earn that offsetting revenue to make it economic. Um, also important to know here, there may be infrastructure investments. Maybe we don't need local generation. Maybe there's a way we can harden the grid um, to provide the, the desired level of reliability and resilience. Next slide, please. And you can go ahead and click uh, two more. There you go, thank you. Um, so th this is just kind of that, that process laid out um, graphically. So there's kind of that objective formulation, uh, objective formulation layer, where again, we're, work we're working with the community. We're working with, um, with those who are affected by current system operations. We're, we're, this is a very much a cross-sectoral effort that you know, state energy offices are very well suited um, to lead. You know, are working with <clears throat> electric utilities, water utilities, gas utilities, transportation providers, emergency providers, 
you know, to identify, okay, if the grid is down, if this event happens, where do we need to be resilient? What loads need to be up? And then again, so we look at, you know, what are the, we do a tariff analysis. What are the local benefits that we can provide? You know, what, um, is there a net metering tariff we can take advantage of? Is there um, um, some kind of demand response program we can participate in? Then on the infrastructure side, can the grid handle this type of use? If we make all these investments, if we invest in a microgrid, can the local grid communicate with that in a way that we'll be able to actually use the thing as, the, as we designed it? Next slide, please. So <clears throat> when starting to think about, you know, how do we how do we weave equity into this process? How do we engage these communities that have been, that have been underserved in the past? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a few key questions that, that can be asked. First is this question of distributed justice. And this is basically where, um, you know, where have customers faced, you know, unfair impacts, you know, are, are customers close to, to fossil fuel generators? Um, are they in a situation where uh, the local grid doesn't allow them to invest um, or to have distributed resources uh, like, like other areas of the system might? Um, recognition justice is who, are there specific groups of, the, of populations that have been affected by this? Um, are there, you know, historical redlining districts for, districts, for example, that may have faced underinvestment? Are there tribal areas that have faced underinvestment? Um, then procedural justice. This is the how. This is how do we get these groups involved in the decision-making process? Do these groups have a seat in utility resource planning processes? Do these groups have a seat in, have a seat in emergency planning exercises? You know, really thinking through the process and making sure that that these groups that, that have not received, um, that have not been able to participate in the past are, are given a chance to participate to make sure that their, their needs are being communicated. And then restorative justice, again, is just, you know, how are we going to correct these, these inequities that we've identified in the previous steps? Next slide, please. So reliability metrics. Um, don't give us a lot of help in this case. Um, reliability metrics are generally system-wide. They're, again, they're system averages. So you see there in that, the top of that pyramid, these are the reliability metrics that are used most commonly. They're system averages. They're, they're asking the question, what is the average customer's experience? We come down a level into what I call disparity metrics. These are rarely used, but they are defined. And essentially what they do is they, they identify, look, some customers are experiencing different levels of reliability. Um, how many of our customers or what percentage of our customers are facing frequent long duration outages? So again, we're recognizing that customers have differing levels of reliability, but we're not identifying who they are or where they are or what those impacts are on those customers. So there's a need really to come to these granular metrics. Um, and this is very much a space of open inquiry. There's a lot being done at the labs. There's a lot being done in the private sector. Um, but one important thing to remember is all these reliability metrics that we've defined they only tell us how the system works during normal operations. If there is a major event, you know, all of those outages, all that outage data is not included in the reliability metrics. So these reliability metrics aren't telling us anything about how customers are affected by major outages. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just wanted to point out that a lot of work is happening in this space. Um, you know, there's some work being done at the labs right now to look at how at a county level, how customers, um, basically the intersection between median income and how much customers spend on energy rates to try and get a little bit more granular data about the energy burdens that customer face, uh, customers face. Next slide, please. So on these last, um, actually, because of time, let's just jump to the next slide as well. So on these last two slides, I just wanted to plug a new program uh, that we've launched at uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab and Sandia National Lab working together. It's called Energy Storage for Social Equity. You know, most of the technical assistance programs that DOE and the labs have done in the past kind of have that top-down problem where you know, we're, we're working with, with y'all, with, uh, with NARUC, with NASIO, um, and we're, we're, we're going top-down, but we're missing a lot of these populations as well. Um, so what we're trying to do now is kind of do that bottom-up TA approach, kind of like we need to do bottom-up planning. We're trying to do bottom-up technical assistance to identify, you know, where are customers that, that haven't received the benefits of these programs? Um, how can we help these customers identify what challenges they're facing, what types of investments they might need to overcome those challenges, and what um, uh, basically just, you know, help, helping them build their capacity 
to engage with their utility, their regulators, their policymakers to, to make sure that those needs are being communicated. Next slide. Um, so there's a link here, um, the energy storage for social equity site. Um, state energy offices are not eligible for this. You know, again, we're, we're trying to keep this very community level, but we're hoping that you might have groups that you're working with, communities that, that may be eligible for this, that might benefit from this kind of program. Uh, so I just wanted to plug that. And uh, with that, just want to thank everyone for their time and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and, and all of our presenters. I was taking lots of notes uh, as you were presenting because I think these are all resources that I know um, Virginia could use and thinking about these alongside the you know, State Corporation Commission and uh, legislators and, and other community-based organizations, um, how to really implement these and, and fund them. So I'm, I'm glad you left that um, left on that final note, Jeremy, with respect to the technical assistance um, offering that is open. Um, I think that was going to be my first question is uh, looking at one of the audience member questions is, you know, this is very expensive, but as we know, um, the, the, the challenges around climate change are extremely expensive. And so thinking about how do we invest in these solutions early is critical. Um, and so could you just touch a little bit more about that technical assistance opportunity that's open? Jeremy, I'll start with you and then others, if you have financing resources or ideas of how states can um, you know, reflect on and, and, and include financing resources uh, in, their, in their programs. Yeah, I, I think the first thing I'll just say is to really emphasize that if you can do resilience in a way that it's also providing reliability, that it's providing benefits when it's not being used for resilience, that makes any financing much, much easier. You know, that that gives you the chance to recoup the investment. If you're just doing resilience for resilience sake, you know, that that will never pencil out. There's no way to recoup that investment. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, second thing I'd say is this this program I mentioned, it is paired with a funding program. So um, some of the some of the participants in the program, some of the groups that receive technical assistance, will also get some funding from DOE to help do demonstration type projects. Um, so there's that. Uh, one other thing I would say is that you know it it might help to really engage with your utility. You know, utilities are making these investments. They're they're doing they they need to build out their system to serve all customers. They have a lot of capital. They have a fairly large tax appetite, so they can take advantage of things like investment tax credits that you know, maybe individual customers don't really have the appetite for. Um, so yeah, just trying to work with the utility to figure out how um, their investments can be done in a way that are meeting the utilities needs, they're meeting the needs of all customers, but they're maybe also addressing equity issues that are funneling certain benefits to certain communities to, to correct past inequities, I, I would say would be something to consider. I'd be happy to jump in on that too. Uh, you know, what, what Jeremy said about the the value, recognizing the value. Um, a, a lot of times there are, just are not uh, ways for, for energy storage to be compensated for the value that it can provide to the grid. So that program I mentioned in, in Massachusetts, I saw there was a question that's also in Rhode Island, will be in Connecticut soon. Uh, New Hampshire has piloted that. Um, there are also similar programs like a bring your own device, bring your own battery programs that places like Green Mountain Power in, in, in Vermont and several other utilities have, have done as well. So utilities often, they, they have that information. They can tell you what the value is to the grid. So those types of programs can make these systems pencil out. Um, uh, and uh, I, think, I think that's the best way to go about this. You know, like, like there has been net metering for solar, recognizing some of the values of, of distributed solar. Energy storage needs more of a national model out there and will probably be a state-by-state -state approach, may look a little different in each state, but there is something there where, where that value needs to be recognized. I will say too, there are some federal opportunities uh, for, for microgrid development. There's uh, the, the FEMA has the uh, BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. And uh, solar and storage is eligible through that program for, for microgrids. So that is an opportunity that the states can look into um, working with cities to, to be able to tap into some of those, those federal funds. I think there will be more money federally coming down the pike. I hope that uh, some of the recent hopefully developments at the, the federal level will create some new opportunities for compensation as well. Dr. Wong? 
Yeah, I would also say that uh, utility companies play a very important role here. So I think uh, it, it would be a good idea to associate that uh, resilience benefits with uh, the reliability uh, improvement that we, all, that we always do. I think the question here for the utility company is that how you can build a, a reasonable risk case uh, if you want to improve the uh, grid resilience, because that's something that you don't see very often, and how you can justify that. So that's, that's the key point here. Um, next question, I'm curious for, especially states with limited resources, um, the best way to access data on uh, either underserved and, and marginalized communities or where, I'll add to this question, where are there particular vulnerabilities within the grid or within the you know, transmission system that um, you know, maybe paired with data around demographics of communities um, should really reflect where to prioritize um, beginning investments. I mean, I'll say on the uh, vulnerable community side, it, there, there is the EPA has the EJ screen tool that can help identify certain you know, social demographic indicators for, for, for vulnerabilities there. Now, how you overlay that with the grid side and transmission side, uh, that gets a little more, more tricky. Um, and I think you, you really got to look into those utility collaborations um, as far as, as, as finding where those two intersect with each other. Yeah, and I will add the US Department of Energy has the energy burden uh, lead tool that is also a good indicator of um, where there are um, you know, high amounts of households at a low income level um, and looking at energy burdens as well. And we have uh, the link to the EJ screen in the chat for everyone. So, can you reflect on any other examples specifically of what states do you think have interesting collaborations that have been put together in a unique way that you think is really moving the needle in terms of where utilities, uh, you know, regulatory bodies, state energy offices are working together to um, move forward projects in this arena? Or re re repeating any examples you may have referred to earlier. And I would, I would maybe also ask Dr. Wong if you think um, in the, in the post-Texas era, you know, if you see those collaborations starting to emerge in a way that are, um, you know, looking optimistic. Yeah, I have not seen much of that going on yet, but uh, I'm sure when people have learned their lessons from the past winter. I'm hoping that uh, the, the things will move, uh, once things move forward, they will take more uh, into account from the utility, from the, the low income community side. So I hope that's the case uh, going on. Yeah, I'll say that, you know, I feel like after every disaster, there there's, tends to be a push. You know, Sandy um, in, in New England, uh, several states, New York and, and Massachusetts and New Jersey, all started microgrid programs after that. I, I think equity was, was less of a consideration um, at the time when those were put together and, and that's coming more and more to the forefront. There are a couple of states that I see there, there's some good action on that front. Uh, New York, uh, they have uh, their um, climate uh, CLCP, I was good, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which is, uh, you know, that's a good uh, taking into account equity considerations in, in, in the clean energy planning for, for New York State. Know that uh, Oregon, Energy Trust of Oregon has been doing some really good work looking at microgrids and, and resilience there. So I'll point to both of those as, as, as good examples of efforts underway. Uh, Go ahead, Jeremy. So I, I would just maybe add Washington State and the Clean Energy Transition Act that passed a couple of years ago. This is the law that requires 100% clean energy by uh, 2045, I believe. They actually, the law actually requires utilities to incorporate equity dimensions into their resource planning, into their clean energy plans. And that's, there's a lot of work to be done, but th there is that legislative and policy support requiring those steps to be taken. 
Yes, yeah, same, same in Virginia, you know, we're at the beginning of that, of that story and that evolution, um, but hopefully up for the challenge. <laughs> um, well, I see we're at time. I will turn it back over to uh, Kristen, and our, Kristen and our hosts at NASIO um, to close out with any final remarks. Thank you so much, Carrie. Um, we really appreciate you moderating, the, moderating this panel. And thank you so much to Dr. Wangstaff and Jeremy for participating. I think this was excellent. The audience, thank you for joining us. We will have a recording and the uh, panelist presentations available for you after the webinar. And we will continue our series on resilience with another webinar in uh, November. Um, so stay tuned um, and check out the NASIO website for that event information. Thank you again and have a good day. <laughs>